Good evening, everybody. I don't think we've ever been this punctual in this series, actually. Um, so uh, welcome to the void in this case, at least a physical void. Welcome to the empty theater Hebel am Ufa Hau tonight for our first online-only edition of our series, Making Sense of the Digital Society. We, that is the Federal Agency for Civic Education, Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung, and the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, the two partners that curate the series. And thank you, of course, to Hebel am Ufa Hau, the third partnering agent that is already experienced in putting things online that were originally intended to be physical first. We thought that the void behind me, which you can see, and behind tonight's speaker to come, is a far more suitable backdrop than yet another bookshelf or men showing off their nostrils to the camera. It also reminds us of a certain realism that is so hard to maintain in this surreal time. This emptiness is the new realness in this crisis, for theaters, that is. Not true for public parks, not for roads in Berlin, if it is true for churches or synagogues or mosques, will be discussed this week. Another space that is far from being empty because of the pandemic is the internet. Rich men get richer, digital capitalism may be, not for the first time, the winner of this crisis. We spend even more time online than before since public physical space is heavily contested in times of corona. But how public is what we perceive as public in digital capitalism? And what does that term refer to exactly in a time when the acute crisis of public health is about to turn into a socioeconomic crisis of the global economy? How are digitization and socioeconomic crisis related? And what can we learn from this about a post-corona world? These are just some of the key questions our speaker tonight is going to address in a minute when he delivers his talk with the title, The Crisis of Digital Capitalism. Crisis in the plural sense. Before I will introduce our speaker, here's a few things about tonight and about the series. First, we will be briefer than we normally are. We do not expect you to hang out here for two hours and get drunk on, well, criticism theory, of course. After the talk, the two of us will start the conversation here on stage. With due distance, of course, it's exactly two meters, actually. It's been measured. And then it will be up to you. You can turn in your questions um, on a participation tool called slido.com. I think you see it on your respective websites if you're watching right now under the hashtag at uh, Digital Society. So Slido sort of simulates uh, the notion of a closed room a bit better than uh, Twitter, we thought. Your questions can be seen by other users as well, and you will have the option to vote uh, on those questions. Christian Graufogel, props to him for organizing these events so well, will read the questions to us in a theater here live. In case you should wake up in the middle of the night and feel like knowing more about this series, you can find most of our events as videos on hiig.de, hiig.de. Go to events and you will find Making Sense of the Digital Society and the Federal Agency for Civic Education, Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung, just launched a project this afternoon called BPB Colon Connect, uh, where our event is being streamed as we speak. It wants to connect with experts and stakeholders, it says, of civic society and education from different regions and countries and to take up international cooperations and debates. The platform started today with the first kickoff and will be built step by step. This is the time I usually, um, in, in my intro, refer to our get-together afterwards, to the small buffet and the drinks in the upper foyer, not tonight for obvious reasons. In order for you not to get too hungry and still be able to have dinner at a reasonable time, we ex uh, expect to finish at about a quarter past eight at the latest for once. So our guest tonight is Professor of Sociology of the Future of Work at the Humboldt University of Berlin and the Einstein Center Digital Future. As a sociologist, he deals with the topics of technology, labor, political economy, and social inequality. In his research in recent years, he has focused on the leading companies of the commercial internet, such as Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Alibaba, and Tencent, as well as various startups. 
He has worked extensively with Heinz Bude in Hamburg and in Kassel, often about the sociology of inequality and topics such as the service proletariat. They together co-edited a book called Kapitalismus und Ungleichheit. Well, our speaker has also three monographies out, the latest from last fall at the renowned German publisher Suhrkamp. It is called Digitaler Kapitalismus, Markt und Herrschaft in der Ökonomie der Unknappheit, from which he will draw a couple of points for tonight's talk, but it is far more than an abstract. The current situation will not be ignored, of course. But now please welcome our speaker, Philipp Stopp. Thanks for having me and thank you for this uh, kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here. I was asked to give a general input about um, economic aspects of digitalization and I thought um, there would be, well, I think there is no sense in talking about digital capitalism right now without talking about the current crisis. The crisis of public health first and foremost, but for many people right now, and definitely in the years to come, an economic crisis of dramatic proportion. It is a crisis of globalized just-in-time capitalism with supply chains disrupted and companies, governments, and citizens suddenly realizing the fragility of global production networks and the impact of this on health and social stability, as well as the systematic relevance of social infrastructure on the one hand, and digital services such as cloud computing, video communication, and of course, online shopping on the other hand. What I want to do today in the following 20 to 25 minutes is to ask in which way we can expect this crisis to also hit the very core of capitalist transformation of recent decades, the digital economy, or as I usually call it, digital capitalism. The digital economy, which is centered around the commercial internet, has for at least the last 20 years been the poster child for the rejuvenation of global capitalism, or at least attempts at such. While large parts of the economy of the OECD world dealt with stagnation, leading digital, com uh, leading digital companies grew through crisis. They grew after the dot-com bust of 2000, building on infrastructure laid out during the boom of the 90s and in a market environment where a good chunk of the competition had been erased by the crash. They grew also after the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, um, and so on, when technology was again considered the new messiah of economic growth with um, the result, of course, as is well known, of a higher and higher concentration of economic power in the hands of leading digital corporations. Will this crisis, or will the crisis to come, be any different for digital capitalism? In order to get an idea of the answer to this question, I argue that we first have to understand two things. First, what is digital capitalism? And secondly, what might be the power technology angle of the present crisis? So let me start by the first question, what is digital capitalism? Well, first of all, it is a concept I borrowed from American historian Dan Schiller, who did two books on the topic, one in the 1990s and one in 2014. With Schiller being a historian, these books are thick descriptions of the political economy of global ICT industries. Me, being a sociologist with a strong interest in political economy, I took a bit of a different approach trying to develop what I would call an analytical theory of contemporary digital capitalism connecting sociology and political economy. This, of course, is no easy task. The term digital capitalism has gained some popularity in broader public discourse in recent years. Here, the term has been used to catch a continuously growing number of phenomena for several years now. Data giants such as Google are supposed to be just as much part of it as self-driving cars, e-commerce platforms, mobile phone networks, washing machines with internet access, and network production facilities, important in Germany, right? Industry 4.0. What it is exactly that these phenomena have in common, however, 
and which would make them different from a broader term of capitalism is not easy, maybe impossible to determine. The obvious simple answer is, of course, that they are all based, at least in part, on digital technologies. And these technologies are integrated into processes of capitalist accumulation and exploitation. Digital plus capitalism then makes digital capitalism. This is what I call digital capitalism as a metaphor. A metaphor for what, one might ask? Well, probably for capitalism as such. A metaphor, of course, does not satisfy our desire for analytical clarity. The question remains as how to the whole matter actually differs from quite normal or other special industrial, cognitive, aesthetic, cybernetic types, forms of capitalism, or put differently, whether we are in fact dealing with a new or at least a, per a particular type of capitalist development. The chances to, uh, to be correct in answering this question with no are probably relatively high. After all, in any known capitalist formation, the common ground outweighs the differences. Otherwise, there would be no stable noun, capitalism, while the adjectives were variable, industrial, cognitive, uh, cognitive digital, and so on. Nevertheless, let me outline two possible answers that formulate different theses on the analytical core of digital capitalism. The first version could be called the data economy story. The second one, which I will emphasize, I will call the privatized markets theory. Let's start with the common ground of both theoretical angles. Instead of developing their theories from a diffuse set of technological applications, latest versions, washing machines, electric cars, digital platforms, and so on, both approaches insist on the basic significance of the commercial internet for a theory of digital capitalism. Here, according to these positions, a specific economic space has developed over the past 20 years, which on the one hand follows its own rules, and on the other hand is in the process of permanently subjugating new areas of the economy. Something that, for example, uh, Josef van Dijk has outlined in her talk, in this talk series as well, brilliantly. So what is the core of these new rules that have developed in the commercial internet? Story one. One possible answer to this question is provided by Shoshana Tsubov, also a guest in this series, in her opulent work, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. It reads, it is about the data. Data is first and foremost the byproduct of digital communication. Whenever we exchange information, we leave traces that some companies use as a separate source of profit. As is well known, the leading companies of this development are the giants of online advertising, Google and Facebook. According to Zuboff, the entire commercial internet can be understood as a huge surveillance apparatus. Since capitalist imperatives are at work, this surveillance machinery must also expand constantly. So according to Zuboff, in recent years, more and more companies have begun to focus their value creation on profits from monitoring, which is why she assumes a rapid advance of surveillance capitalism. In this picture, smart washing machines, e-commerce platforms, or household robots might be part of digital capitalism because they enable the appropriation of data by surveillance capitalist corporations. What is new about digital capitalism is then the rise of an economic logic which is not aimed at resource efficient production of things, productivity, but at measuring, influencing, and ultimately controlling our behavior. Now what about the second story? The one about privatized markets. From this perspective, it seems more interesting which larger economic project this data economy is actually embedded in. After all, an economy cannot consist exclusively of online advertising. My answer to this question is that we are dealing with a project to build up privatized, or to put it more precisely, proprietary markets. 
The preliminary stage of such privately owned markets are the platform companies of the commercial internet, which have in many cases established themselves as commercial monopolies for certain services such as taxi rides, Uber, music and, music and video streaming, Spotify, Netflix, or food delivery. These private markets, however, are embedded in the socio-technical ecosystems of a small number of companies, among which the most important ones are Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook, at least for the global West. The other platforms circulate like satellites around these platform planets. By binding our attention, the planets, or you could call them meta platforms as well, are more and more in control of what we perceive at all. They control a large chunk of our attention, as can be seen, for example, in ever-growing screen time during the current corona crisis. This position of power is a goldmine because in increasingly competitive consumer markets, only those who can create attention for their products are actually able to sell them. Control of users' attention actually means control of consumption time, or to put it more abstract, Control user attention means control the demand side of a market. Surveillance capitalist advertising is thus one way of capitalizing on consumer attention or on the control of demand. It is, of course, just one such way, which is why the privatized markets theory emphasizes a variety of mechanisms of capitalizing on the market-like function of meta platforms. Most of these mechanisms are based on different types of fees, which the meta platforms charge for their function as markets, including, of course, revenues from advertising, but also more direct fees of, for market participation, like, say, the 30% of, revenue, of revenues Google's and Apple's app stores charge for transactions between, say, a German gamer and a game developing company in the Philippines. The pointed thesis about digital capitalism then is that the leading companies of the commercial internet, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, do not really operate in markets whose pricing mechanisms they might, for example, distort. They are these markets. They are these markets in the sense that for the economic space of the commercial internet, they are the ones connecting almost all the supply, apps, other software, content of all sorts, e-commerce products, to almost all the demand, everybody having a digital device. By constantly expanding their product and service portfolios and controlling the distribution channels for the products of an ever-increasing number of external providers, these private markets are permanently expanding their offerings. On the demand side of the market, i.e. with consumers, they rely on different lock-in strategies. On the one hand, their own systems are continuously optimized for maximum convenience in order to reduce the need to switch to another system. On the other hand, they often make it difficult for consumers to use certain services outside their own ecosystems. Lock-in effects can be observed empirically, for example, in retention rates of around 90% for both mobile operating systems, iOS and Android. It doesn't really matter then for the power of these companies that there are two of them theoretically competing for users when 90% of the users never leave their provider. The power of market ownership materializes in four distinguishable forms of control. Information control through surveillance is only the first step, which incidentally is by no means only aimed at consumers, but also and particularly at producers. Through information control, platform companies not only want to tell us what to buy, so to speak, they also, and maybe more importantly, want to tell producers what to make and how to make it. Uber drivers, booksellers on Amazon, app producers all over the world are told exactly 
how to deliver their services by the market owners. The rules and conditions of how to behave on a privatized market are made by those same companies, the market owners, leaving little choice to producers on how to deliver their services. Why does this even work, one might ask. Well, it works because information control enables three further forms of control which are essential to privatized markets and which enforce the, the power of platforms over producers. So information control is the first type of control. The second one is control of excess. Platforms rule over who can participate in a market. Amazon, for example, regularly blocks third-party vendors from its platform, sometimes for very good reasons like fake medical equipment, sometimes for reasons that are not so well understandable. The third one is control of prices. How much someone can charge for a product depends on the market environment, which is controlled by the meta platforms. Platform operators have, for example, the opportunity to strategically expand their own offerings in order to lower prices for consumers and thus increase sales accordingly and accordingly their revenues. Fourth, they cannot uh, they can, to a large extent, control the performance of producers operating in their market-like structure. Just as publishers, how Amazon or Facebook have changed the rules of books or online publishing. Or check out the talk from Rasmus Kleis Nielsen in this talk series. A little footnote on that matter. Which angle on questions of power and inequality does this process imply? Let me just stress one very basic aspect. Imagine an economy run through the organizing principle of proprietary markets, like the ones we were talking about. In other words, imagine a world which is like the internet. In such an economy, a relevant amount of revenues, educated guess, 30%, might be extracted by market-like platforms. Where are they extracted from? Well. If you take the commercial internet, the answer in most cases is they are extracted from producers, not from consumers. Consumers get highly subsidized products, as is well known, in order, in order to keep them attached to the platforms. But producers have to play by the rules of market-owning companies, which includes their fees. Say again, 30% of revenue. These 30% are then missing on the producer or supply side of these markets. But this is exactly where in this whole equation or this whole framework, labor is located. People are not only consumers. Most of them have to work to make a living and they usually do so in producing some sort of thing or service. When 30% of their revenue is missing, this is, at least as a principle, 30% missing from wages of these workers. So this is how this whole thing is and a source of social inequality. Footnote end. Now how might, we, how, might we, how might we sum up all this in an analytical way? Well, asking about the analytical meaning of the formation of proprietary markets, one is not referred to something completely new, but rather to something quite ancient in the capitalist economy. Proprietary markets correspond to the return of an idea which shaped the early capitalist pre-liberal epoch in Europe, mercantilism. Unlike in liberalism and also unlike in neoliberalism, the basis of mercantilism at the time was an understanding of world trade as a zero-sum game. This was particularly evident in the importance of, the, of an active trade balance, which was the central goal of the mercantilist state. From this perspective, prosperity could only be achieved by cheating other parties. Positive trade balances were regularly squeezed off the opposing parties by brute force, for example, with the help of state-guaranteed and protected trade monopolies, such as the British East India Company. Those were the market owners of the 17th century. 
Digital capitalism's leading companies are the market owners of today. This time, however, we are dealing with privatized mercantilism. The big difference between the emerging system of proprietary markets and classical mercantilism lies in the respective role of the state. It was the state which promoted traditional trade monopolies because it profited from their businesses. The proprietary markets of the commercial internet, however, on the other hand, are privatized sector company, private sector companies that in recent years have been criticized for various anti-state practices, tax avoidance, for example, or the promotion of fragmentation of the political public sphere. The state, in other words, could be described as the big loser of this development, especially since more and more of its infrastructure relies on services delivered by digital capitalism's leading companies. So getting back to the start again, will the crisis to come be any different for digital capitalism than the crisis that preceded it? Preceded it. When sticking to questions about the state, we might be able to get the clearest picture of how it might differ however gradually. Of course, the immediate effects of the current crisis on technology are on the business side of things, probably reproducing a situation similar to the post.com and post-2008 situation. During the first weeks of the lockdown when consumer markets collapsed, Amazon became more popular and powerful than ever. This, of course, might mean more than a possible upward bump in revenues. It might drastically change the image of Amazon, creating something like a patriotic tech image, very different to what we discussed as tech clash, tech clash in recent years. Another aspect is the window of opportunity for deep-pocketed technology companies when it comes to acquisitions. When financial markets will dry up or collapse in the course of the economic crisis to come, these companies might be even more capable of buying any potentially competitive startup on the market. Again, this is not only a possibility for expanding their market function for more and more services, and of course, a huge blow to competition. It is also a hard punch for any political strategy to strengthen something like a third way through digital capitalism by publicly funding innovation or startups. How could one build European tech champions when acquiring them becomes even easier than in recent years? This power shift between the state and big technology companies is probably most obvious in the process of immediate crisis management itself. When states hectically try to ramp up their data management skills in order to allocate resources, bats, ventilators, labor, etc., Palantir, AWS, and others were right on the spot. When the idea of managing the pandemic through contact tracing apps gained popularity, Google and Apple rose to the occasion by delivering infrastructure which seems to be without an alternative. When fake news about the virus had to be stopped, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok provided both possibilities to regulate the spread of false information through AI and advertising opportunities, for example, for the WHO. When states invested in the development of vaccines or drugs, biotech companies such as Verily, part of Alphabet, or Vir Biotechnology, funded by Notorious SoftBank, were ready to offer their services and thus entered the promising health sector. Are these only spotlights, or are these signs of a particular development? If the latter is true, we might be observing in real time right now not only how the corona crisis is further, further strengthening the power of privatized markets, just like the dot-com bust and the crisis of 2008 and 2009 did, we might actually be seeing a rapid acceleration of the state's deepening stru structural dependency on leading digital corporations, signs not only of big tech's power over the economy or digital capitalism, but indeed over the digital society and its state. Thank you.
I really missed the applause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too, definitely. It's funny. It's really <laughs> funny sitting here with no applause at all. So thank you a lot for this very condensed and uh, insightful um, talk you just gave us, Philip. Thank you so much for that. Um, let me start with something you um, noted a little bit on the fly toward the end of your talk, which is the tracing app uh, everybody discusses now uh, in Germany. Um, it seems as if the state favored a more invasive model than the platforms like Google and Apple, actually, right? That uh, favor an app that stores data decentrally in devices and not in a central data bank, which is something the state favored. To me, that seems like uh, some almost like a freak reversal of a discursive pattern as we had known it up until recently. What do you make of that? Well, it's, it's, I'm, I'm in a way astonished just the way you are. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I mean, the, the, one, of my, one of the people working for me just wrote me today um, that he asked himself whether this is a win for civic society mm -hmm. or whether it is a win for Apple. Mm -hmm. And we just don't know. I mean, a lot of things um, which are happening during this crisis, we really have to say how they play out. I observed a little bit during the last weeks when it became clear that the centralized um, version of the app was, was sort of gaining popularity among key players, um, how parts of, say, the, the spectrum in Germany, which also has a certain stake into this whole situation, looked at it and it was really boiling there. People were angry and they, they wrote to everybody. And I mean, you could describe it at also in a way that um, probably it wasn't mainly or only Apple, it was also the outcry by certain actors who stand themselves in a competitive field or within a conflict about the question how, well, digital Europe, so to speak, is supposed to look in the future. And I mean, I want to stay an optimist, which is uh, hard enough <laughs> in, this, in these hard times. So uh, my, I might take it as a win for a, say, decentralized sovereignty and individual rights-based sort of So um, are you approach. basically saying that uh, digital capitalism or some agents of digital capitalism sort of integrated critique uh, that came from civic uh, society in this case, which is uh, a common thing. Capitalism keeps on doing that. Um, is that a case of just that? Well, as I said, it's probably not a case of just that. I mean, we should not uh, ascribe just all the agency to those companies. We should have be on the lookout for um, other agencies. And if there are temporary alliances, uh, that doesn't mean that the effect of these alliances is generally a bad thing just because those companies took part. But of course, I mean, looking especially at the role, um, at, the, at the fact that Google is in the mix there, um, of course, we should remain very, very cautious um, as to what actually will be the 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 result of um, of this app nobody really knows now we, we we think now that the decentralized approach is favored but what it actually means will only be clear when the thing is there and we can observe it and that's just not the case yet let me tap into your i'm sure key competence of uh, defining terms of uh, political economy and uh, sociology there and the term i'm interested in referred to is the term uh, labor um, when you were talking about extracting revenue up to 30 percent of digital capitalist agents from producers but then you also said well consumers are not just consumers uh, to a certain extent they are also what laborers prosumers, what, uh, how would you define that there? So if you're uploading our photos and uh, uh, you know, contributing texts and everything, um, how would you define, would you define that as labor at all or is it something else? No, I mean, I'm, I'm well aware of this controversy and, um, and the several positions one can have on that question. I was referring to something uh, much more basic. All I wanted to say is that you and me, we are consumers when we buy things, but we are also producers when we work. We produce some sort of thing or service. Say, in my case, education or books, in your case, events or, you know, radio, that sort of stuff. So I wasn't even referring to the whole question of prosumption and so on, while I would never doubt the fact that this exists, would I build a um, critical approach to digital capitalism on the fact that user data can be used to sell advertising a lot? <laughs> no, I would not. I would say the whole thing is a lot bigger 
than this question. One of the main goals of um, platforms is of call, you know, in what you call digital capitalism is the time uh, we spend online. So the actual duration, the continuous relationship is what Nick Coldry called it, uh, also one of her speakers in this um, scene series. There is a lot of talk of disruption when it comes to digitality, but the consumer relation is the very, very much the opposite of, of disruptive. It is uh, not ruptured, but seemingly seamless, you know, it's, a, it's continuous. Um, it's almost like a contract that never expire, so to speak, if we agree to the terms of service and, and all this. Would you say this is a form of subjugation that does have neo-colonial traits or neo-feudal, or would you still compare it to mercantilism as you did in the latter part of your talk? I did compare it to mercantilism when looking at sort of the accumulation logic behind it. I mean, can we grab other terms to describe other phenomena that are part of the broader um, thing that we call digital capitalism, sure. Um, I, I was basically interested in the question, I would say, well, I, well, the question I was asking myself when thinking about digital capitalism was, um, which are the criteria that I can use in order to um, be able to say something about whether this is actually um, something particular, mm -hmm. right? New is not really the point. The point is whether it matters, right? Because it is special in a way. And um, the, the, the category I, I sort of was um, tending towards um, is the question of accumulation, mm -hmm. how accumulation is organized. And when we look at those market-like platforms, especially the big meta platforms, I would argue that accumulation is basically organized in the way trade monopolies are organized. They are the market for a certain type of of a certain category of products, a lot more today than the trade monopolies of the 17th century. They make the prices for these products and their, um, their share is basically, well, I'd, I'd argue in, in, a certain, um, in a certain wording of political economy, you could call it rents they are extracting, right? Especially the digital platforms because, um, I mean, you know, we were talking about prosumers. Another big aspect of uh, the debate around the digital economy is the whole question of how those companies are actually making a profit from products that are, in the classical term, not scarce, right? Mm -hmm. oh. Digital products themselves, they, they are not scarce. So how do they do it? Well, they do it by controlling access to the market and then putting a price on participating in that market. And when, while they can scale these, infra these infrastructures which are the market without significant cost related to the profits they make, you could actually say their infrastructure themselves is actually not, you cannot describe them as a scarce infrastructure. So then they make money from products that are not scarce with infrastructure that is also not scarce in comparison to their profits. That's rent seeking basically. It's not like productive labor, if you will, that is, or productivity, profits from productivity, which is produced there. Let us stay with uh, the notion of proprietary markets in a minute, uh, but uh, I forgot to tell you that you still can ask questions uh, on the Slido app, actually. I think it's still open and it's uh, being curated. You can vote uh, questions up or down, whether you think they're interesting or a little less interesting. So we're trying to get a little bit of diversity uh, uh, in the questions in a minute. Um, well, when you compared mercantilism, say roughly 18th century, 17th century, to um, liberal forms of capitalism, um, you sort of tied them together with the notion of monopolies, right? I mean, there used to be monopolies uh, that the state profited from. Uh, in mercantilism. And uh, now we have monopolies or proprietary markets, as you call them, that are completely private. So the state has basically uh, no say in it. And you even that in your book, I forgot to hold that into the camera when I introduced it to you, Digitala uh, uh, Capitalismus, you also refer to the uh, venture capital, which is very global in all of those, um, actually mega platforms you talk about, even the Chinese ones. It's a uh, globalized uh, venture capital that is in there. You cannot talk of national agents there, even if they're Chinese, right? So the state has no say in it, so to speak. What are the options um, of the state in the future? Well, that's that's the so the, the one million dollar question. Yeah. Or the one million euro question. You should you could ask. Well, <laughs> I mean, what I was 
trying to well, I'd say the discussion I wanted to open um, this evening is basically if the probable outcome of the crisis to come is a further, further strengthening, a further concentration of power around these leading companies of um, digital capitalism, then what could be a broader strategy for an alternative, right? I mean, there are, for years, there have been different um, ideas uh, about options um, have been on the, on the market, right, have been discussed. Um, but you could, you could try to draw it from the current situation as it accelerates so many of the anyway basic features of digital capitalism, right? So when you think about the gain in reputation of those companies, what I called the probable rise of patriotic tech, right? Um, I would argue that you do have another dynamic as well which is on the other side of the, uh, well, market-state um, relationship, which are the reputation gains of the state, of which we just do not know whether they will be stable or not and whether we consider them a good thing or a bad thing. We probably consider them, you probably consider them a good thing if uh, you have trust in your state. You probably consider them a bad thing if you don't, right? But um, there are reputation gains of the state as it has shifted from, say, only claiming responsibility for, um, well, for creating employment through creating um, economic growth to um, a situation where it is protecting the life of its citizens in the rawest sense, right? And this, of course, might create new sources of um, legitimacy for the state. Right? People after the crisis might look at the state and ask different questions when, or ask the question, what is a good state in a different way? And um, it's actually something I'm, I'm looking at in a current <laughs> project right now. We do not have any um, results yet. But there is this reputation gain. There are new sources of legitimacy which the state might simply have to serve and which then might clash with the logics of, of accumulation that those companies um, try to... Um, try to broaden as well. And of course, there is something you could call, well, a new swag of the state, right? This, this whole thing about the, I mean, sorry for the German audience, Markus Söder, right? Uh, of all persons, right? Markus Söder was talking about a gigantic stimulus that we need for a Europe after the COVID-19 crisis. I mean, this is in a way not neoliberalism anymore. This is a political swag that we have not seen um, for decades, and to me, well, to, 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 to be a bit personal, I'm, I'm 36 years old, um, I do not really know much else than neoliberalism. I do not really know much else as a political practice, and um, getting sort of a sense of um, something happening that differs, obviously, at least up to this point. How it might play out is a different story, but up to this point it differs. It makes me sort of... Well, it is, the, it is the small grain of good that I see in this whole thing, right? I saw a meme the other day that uh, read, what's the point of capitalism if socialism has to bail it out every 10 years? That's just about what you uh, referred to with Markus Söder, I think, uh, in Bavaria, um, so to speak. Like, uh, Let's take a little bit, uh, before we take the questions from the bird's eye view, uh, maybe from the public's view. Most people, of course, I'm sure it's uh, no different with you, uh, spend a lot more time on platforms uh, now you know, during this crisis. It almost seems like an old utopian, you know, the old utopian 90s notions of connection and belonging uh, even are sort of resurfacing during this uh, pandemic. It's almost as if the internet had gotten good again, like an article uh, in The Atlantic, I think, read. I'm not trying to write an easy polemic here, actually. I mean, you know, it is nice to be able to talk to your parents who are maybe old and far away, uh, to talk with your friends, have a drink with them, you know, sort of. Um, on the other hand, you know, the business model has not changed one bit. What do you make of this situation in terms of reputation gain? Isn't that exactly what is happening right now? Now, that platforms that have been heavily critiqued before are sort of living or sort of gaining reputation uh, uh, right now and are sort of forcing those alliances we were talking about when we talked about the tracing app. I mean, there, there is this one thing that, that you could, if you blow it up a little, right? Zoom is maybe a different story. 
it worked. Of we we know about all these problems, zoom bombing and so on. But just put that aside as well uh, for a minute. It is a story of just spectacular new growth, which is not straight, at least con uh, directly, at least connected to um, other big platforms. So you could describe it as a newcomer within this um, this type of economy, and. Um, the point then is, I would argue, that you can imagine um, all the services we are consuming right now being embedded in a very different type of, um, of accumulation. Maybe no accumulation at all, but I mean, also different types of accumulation if you are a friend of capitalism, okay? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of separate ways um, to do that, and the interesting thing well, this is, this is weird to, to talk about your own idea as being interesting and so on, but, but the thing that I came up at actually after the book, um, that I came up with actually after the book um, as being sort of an interesting aspect is that um, we might be able to learn from those market-like platforms in order to create a more decentralized or, or may, we'll say better governed, more democratic um, uh, type of digital economy. Uh, because those companies have taught us, if you look, for example, at, at these mechanisms or strategies of, of control, how to govern markets in a very, very efficient way. And if you look at problems with the, which will arise with the crisis to come, the economic crisis to come, but also with, say, the, the broader crisis we're in, um, um, which is climate change, then, I mean, I guess most people would agree that this won't work without governing markets. So what you could, you could even argue that when you look at the commercial internet, you see a blueprint for, for a world where um, the governance of markets, from which we can draw an idea of how the governance of markets could work, and all we need to do, all we need to do, right, but all we need to do is to attach that to other criteria, to other purposes that matter, right? So there also, I would say, once um, the state, whatever this state is, um, takes a bigger part in this whole type of, whole process of um, um, economic restructuring, uh, there is also reason for optimism because it might learn how to govern markets um, attached to democratic goals. So if platforms are markets for themselves, if they're proprietary markets, as you argued, um, it, they might be still very hard to govern right in the present tense because there was, um, there was a study, there was a paper actually from Humboldt Institute for Internet and uh, Society into Internet Policy Review at the end of March, I think beginning of April, that said how platform governance is really frail at the moment because they have to pe you know, send people home on a very basic level and um, they're actually delegating a lot of governance of their platforms to AI, to artificial intelligence. And uh, a lot of mistakes happen. So people who have sown mass Masks in the U.S., you know, uh, have been punished or removed from certain sites because it was thought to be um, a rip-off or um, selling medical equipment, which wasn't medical, and so forth. So a lot of mistakes have happened, and uh, we're not even talking about hate speech and and uh, conspiracy theories and all that. So platform governance, the paper at least argued, is especially frame uh, frail, weak, so to speak, at this very moment. So this must be a very tough future to actually govern those platforms at the time time and there some of them are exponentially growing almost yeah well I don't know if it is I mean we will see how it plays out the point I'm making is um, is not that uh, all this will happen by itself and just like that that's not the point the point that I'm making is that we are seeing the sort of outlines of a stronger conflict emerging and it might just be that this conflict between the state, which has to um, cater to new needs for legitimacy mm -hmm. uh, for its citizens, uh, between this state and between um, big tech, which delivers the infrastructure, which is basically uh, saying, well, these look at the Corona app, this is the cheap solution to social distancing, take it and, and, um, and go ahead. Um, this conflict um, is one that people can engage in now. And the Corona app, the, the contact tracing app we're talking about is actually 
the way we talked about it sort of was to understand it as an example of this sort of conflict, which didn't so far seems not to have had the worst outcome, right? <laughs> Um, so um, th this is this is the the only point I'm making, and um, I would argue that we have. Well, would I argue that it is more probable um, that we get a stronger public governance of the internet, and this is a good thing? No, I would probably argue that. Well, as I did in my presentation, that the opposite outcome is is more probable. But also, there is a new dynamic in this whole. Conflict, uh, conflict situation, which we need to observe, and I'd say if you're an activist, you need to engage in it, right? This is the time to take questions. I think, I hope there are any. Christian Graufogel from Humboldt in, uh, Institute for Internet and Society will read them out for us. Is there anything on Slido, Christian? Yes. Hello. Good evening. I'm waiting for the signal. Okay. Yes. Um, there are actually a lot of questions on okay. Slido. Um, we try to cluster them a bit um, because we obviously can't answer or ask all the questions, but we try to um, at least um, ask a couple of questions. So um, we start with questions about um, uh, which area of civic life is most vulnerable to digital capitalism and surveillance? Is it health, politics? That was a top voted question. Which one is more vulnerable? Which area of civic life is most vulnerable to digital capitalism and surveillance? Is it health or politics or maybe even another sector? Well, I, the way I see it, politics has already been included into this dynamic to a very large extent. So, well, then again, the question is what is politics, but say what we consider as this whole framework of the, with this whole process of deliberation between media, citizens, parties, and so on. This is integrated heavily through social media and uh, advertising and so on um, into this process. Health so far is um, as our most uh, public services or public goods, um, a place uh, or an area where those companies have tried to expand um, strongly for, well, for a rather long time actually. And um, a, big, a big risk in this crisis is that a lot of things that, you know, were meeting a lot of uh, stop signs along the way and therefore took forever, um, making it possible to build up um, other alternatives or, 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 or well, lasting stop signs, um, might now just fall very quickly as, well, as the example with AWS and Palantir goes, which just went very, very quickly, and now they're in, and we see how sticky they are, right? Um, so, um, of course, we are starting, or there is, well, there is a, a grab of those companies for um, what we would consider public goods, or in a more recent term, the foundational economy um, within our broader um, economy. And um, health and politics are one part. Mobility is another part. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting area um, where you can also sort of observe um, what I called learning from this whole proprietary markets logic. Um, I mean, there are all over Europe, in, in bigger cities, there are attempts at building public meta platforms for urban transport. Starting with um, starting with uh, the public transport, which is of course like the big heavyweight inside this this market, and then connecting other private services, uh, e-scooters, uh, share share bikes, and so on, into these platforms. And you could probably describe it. At least I did so. My impression is um, that this market, for example, is one where those public platforms are competing. Well, with who? I guess with Google Maps, right? People use Google Maps if they want to have what you call intermodal types of mobility. But this battle or this conflict at least is not lost yet. And it's an example of how the public, or well, public administrations take on this logic of proprietary markets and try to attach it to other purposes or other goals like, say, safety and uh, um, safety of distribution, Versorgungssicherheit. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of stuff. 
and to democratic governance in a way, right? So this might be the model that we want to see pop up in more and more of this, these uh, markets within the foundational economy. Well, um, I have a next question, which is uh, probably well in line with uh, which what you just uh, said. The question is about the power um, and the thematic field of power. Um, do you think the power of platforms can still be regulated at all? Uh, how would you rate the risk of platforms digitali digitally colonizing, especially the global south? Global south? Yes. Can platforms be regulated at all? Yes, of course they can. I mean, it's, it's a question of power. And this is why, again, I'd say the new, sorry for this, this term, the new swag of the state that we are seeing right now is a reason for optimism, at least if you live in a country where you have a certain confidence, a certain trust in your state. Right? Because, see, a lot of, if you look at it from a political economy uh, perspective, a lot of pieces are moving right now. Those moving pieces are not only the questions of platform governance, it is, for example, the questions of how will a post COVID um, global economy look in terms of trade, right? When everybody's talking now about re. Uh, re uh, renationalizing certain um, or opening certain production spaces within the nation state in order to have a safe access to certain equipment and so on. This, these are all things that really sort of attack the neoliberal core of um, free trade agreements and so on. And once th this piece is moving, the piece to regulate bigger platforms, say at least in Europe, is moving as well because once you're out of the free trade um, uh, a jacket, in a way, um, you can you, you can do things that you could not do before. You know, I mean, you you don't we do not have a digital tax and certain platform regulations in Europe because German automakers wanted to sell and still want to sell their cars to to the states. Say because these pieces are moving, this option one at one point is taking off the table. Well, what stops us then from doing that? The I mean, it's the, it's no secret that the the, the, the white books, the plans for that sort of stuff are in, inside the desks of public administrations. It's not something we still need to figure out how to do. We just need to do it. And the, the power framework we were in so far is one that prohibited us from doing it in a way, you, can see, you could argue for good reasons, if you are living in Germany and profiting from an export-oriented model and so on, right? Um, but yeah, as I said, these, these pieces might moving and well, I, I cannot really answer that questions in a you know, final way. I can only say, it's, isn't it interesting that those pieces are moving now? I think it's, it's terribly interesting and it will be very, I'm very curious um, what the outcome will be. So it's not about a lack of idea, it's a, a, about a, you know, a question of power, as you said at the beginning yeah, uh, of your answer. Christian, what we maybe could do is just um, pose a couple of questions together, or three, and then see if he can bind everything together like he so brilliantly has done in the last <laughs> 20 minutes of this okay, conversation. I try to cluster them a bit. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a question regarding data, um, regarding the assumption of new digital capitalism. How important is the monetary exploitation of behavioral data in the overall economy? Um, then there was a question regarding alternative platforms. So there were a couple of questions. Uh, we selected one. Um, one was, uh, would you say destroying the big companies' monopoly on data is an option, and how could this be done? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yes. Um, do platform... Well, sorry? Destroying the monopolies. Would you say done. destroying the big companies' monopoly on data is an option, and how could this be done? And then there have been a couple of questions on our personal role in digital capitalism. Um, we're both uh, rated quite high, so we will post both. Um, one was, uh, what is the role of tech practitioners, software developers and engineers in addressing the crisis of digital capitalism? And what is the role or what should the role of consumers be now? Should we even call us just consumers? We are also workers, producers, users, citizens. Okay. Um, 
The first question I, I didn't really quite understand, which is why we are, well, because we're sitting quite far from each other and you probably hear him a lot better than I do. But I these, were, these were brilliant questions, but seven, maybe if I, maybe I touch it, if I don't, you, you just read it again to me. So um, alternative platforms destroy data monopolies. Um, Yes, I think it is possible. I mean, also for that sort of stuff, the policy approaches um, are there. They just haven't been used yet, right? This is, this is, this is the way I would describe um, this situation. I cannot go into detail also because it's not my primary, primary like I'm, there might be people a lot more competent about that than me. Um, but um, I just want to sort of uh, make one reference to it, or at least ask a question, because there's one thing about this whole um, opening or breaking the, the data monopolies, this particular way of talking about breaking the, up the monopolies, um, which just I, I, I sort of, I, I never could figure out myself. I mean, um, there is this whole idea that once you open up the data pools, it will unleash, um, let's say you force uh, big tech companies to share their data, open source it, and so on, um, that this will unleash innovation um, in a way that we have not seen before. My whole approach to digital capitalism is one that doesn't really buy into the narrative of innovation. I mean, if you look at it from a very sort of simple and, um, yeah, from a very simple uh, perspective, you could say that the big innovations um, of the, the, at least the big tech companies, are innovations in consumption. They have been rationalizing consumption to an extent, outbeating competition by lowering prices and so on, to an extent that, that is just has, has been unimaginable before, right? But is this really what we consider to be innovation? And if this is what those companies can do, can we really argue or can we, should we really rely on our hope that just opening up these data pools will then unleash good innovation, whatever that is supposed to mean? I mean, not to say that this is not possible and that this would not be something to, to strive for, but I mean, we, we also have to be careful in, in reproducing the narratives of those companies themselves, because then we, we just we basically bought their narratives, right? Um, which is, for example, and this is another point about this whole question of, of data monopolies, that their whole power is based on data, which is in a way true, but say the Zuboff story of surveillance capitalism is one, well, to me it always reads like sort of a very big book about online advertising. Right? The other use cases for this sort of data um, economy stuff, they, they, it gets very quickly, it gets very, very thin. And a lot of it is hope, right? It is just, and it's hope that is sort of from a mixed, mixed discourse of consultancy firms, those tech companies themselves, and other actors. And I just, I, I, I just, I just don't buy it, um, say, completely. So, um, my, again, my, my basic point here um, to make is, and maybe this touches the whole question, the whole first question, which was in a way about money, right? Um, uh, the, the real resource which has made those companies great, uh, or great, well, huge, um, that has been, which has been neglected, might not be data, it might be money. It might be money, it might be the fact that they can buy every competitor on the market, right? This might be the key to their success. And the fact that they grew so big, especially after the crisis of 2008, might have something to do with the fact that the global money supply was doubling between 2008 and 2017. Money just wasn't a scarce resource, right? I mean, this is a whole, a very a much more conventional <laughs> capitalism-like story um, of this whole field, which to me at least sounds rather plausible. Well, this whole data um, story um, has a lot of problems. Another problem um, of, this, of this story is, for example, that um, it, it seems to be like, again, we are choosing, say, the easy way. And the easy way is, 
we want to have more open data, so let's put all the public, make all the public data open data first, right? Have all these open data initiatives within the cities and so on and so on. And I, I never can wrap my head around how this should actually not profit big tech companies a lot more than anybody else. Because they, if, they, if it is true that all their power is based on data, right? It should, be, it should be the case that they are a lot more capital, capable than other companies to then sort of profit from this public data. So why should we throw it at them? If data is the new you know, uh, currency of power, we should use it strategically, say in order to, and this uh, is part of this whole alternative platforms question, in a way that it, um, it helps the platforms that are in the public's interest, and it doesn't help those who aren't. Should I go on, or, or, should, or do you want to intervene? I mean, I didn't even touch the third question, but I can. I mean, it's should I repose it, or do you still? Uh, do you, you grab your mic. I don't know if you want to. No, no, no. no. If you want to go on answering them, sure. It's so, last question is the one um, about the role of practitioners. Um, I mean, there are so many um, very just great and sympathetic. Um, um, initiatives within the broader, like, not big tech type of um, digital economy. And um, the person who asked the question might be a lot better in, in answering it than I am. Um, the other half of the question was about this whole how to, how to make sense of us being consumers and producers and so on um, at the same time. The way um, I make sense of it when, lo when looking at digital capitalism is... Um, is very simple. Um, we, come from a, we come from a tradition in which, say, after the Second World War, in a way also before, we have seen um, different phases or steps in the expansion of rights, right? First you had political rights, and so on, later you had social rights. Um, then you had uh, rights at work and so on. And the only type of rights, right? Rights are always attached to citizens. The only type of rights that has been expanding in neoliberalism, while the other ones were sort of scaled down or at least stopped expanding, were the rights of consumers, right? So people sort of learned to understand themselves as consumers. And they sort of were socialized in doing so as also by those platforms, right? Because they were only addressed as consumers. Even when we consume news today, we are addressed in the logic of online advertising in, in, in many situations, right? So um, when you then take into account my footnote, right? Which was that um, in a way this is, if you take it as a system, as an emerging system, this is all rather bad news for labor. Right? Because the whole system is based on extracting, say, 30% of revenues from the side of labor and give it to the market owners who put it on their bank accounts. Right? Um, then what you would see is an alliance of capital and consumers against labor. That would be the current situation. Now, you cannot tell people, which is sort of something I, I've been, well, let's say in the, in the political spectrum in Germany when there, there have been ideas of, well, is there, is there a possibility to, to create sort of uh, um, public legitimacy by taking on big tech, right? And I, would, I, would, I was always arguing, no, there isn't. There isn't because you cannot in a situation where wages, for example, have been uh, stagnating in many countries uh, in the OECD world for decades and the only um, the companies who have been expanding have been companies that have subsidized consumption, right? You cannot sell to people that they should give all this stuff up while their wages don't increase, right? Um, so if this is not the way out, sort of, if this social conflict is, is in, a, in a situation of, uh, where it's blocked in a way, right? Then um, we have to bring back another uh, figure, and this figure that is not inside the equation, and that is the citizen, right? Which is I, I, why I would argue, like the questions do in a way, um, that the question of, the, of democracy is the one that is much easier uh, to politicize than the question of capitalism within this whole framework.
Maybe we have one last question before I would add the very last one, like we usually do here um, in this series and wrap this up for everybody to have dinner. And as I said, it's going to be a little shorter than usually, uh, but uh, there's time for one more audience question from Slido, I think. Yes. Please, Christian. Uh, I'm coming back to the questions of platforms because a lot of people post questions of uh, platforms and alternatives, platforms models. So uh, one question was, um, do platforms based on differentiation and value co-creation instead of standardization and higher value capture have any chance to survive in the market? Uh, well, they, they might have if they have a certain niche which then is always the question of when will other bigger tech companies take on that niche and catch an interest in that? Who's Probably at the point when, when it gets sort of, when it gets really going, right? <laughs> which is bad. Or they might be able um, to survive when they, when they have a certain type of protection, right? Which is again, why you have to look at all the moving pieces in a way to get an idea about what that sort of protection might be. And of course, the idea I, I, you might have, and I'm having as well, is that um, a good place to start might be um, everything that we consider to be, in one way or another, public goods. Why? First, because it's the thing those companies are going for now. And secondly, there is sort of a, public, a political and public situation where people might say, well, this is something we should better keep under public control, right? So where would I start? I would start... Um, with this sort of stuff at where, where I could expect some sort of support from the public democratic side when sort of lobbying hard enough for it, right? I mean, this is, of course, also a political um, struggle. Um, and this would be uh, the foundational economy. Now, as a very last question, uh, Philip, uh, it seems to me that um, this historical trajectory is sort of central to your argument, right? If you're comparing uh, what you call digital capitalism to earlier forms of capitalism, pre-liberal forms of capitalism, mercantilism. So uh, if you take a look how mercantilism uh, started to end, the beginning of the end of uh, mercantilism was we could start with the French Revolution, we could then go on to the bourgeois revolutions in the uh, uh, you know, mid-19th century, and of course unions and workers' movements and all that. So it took a very long time to sort of disrupt uh, that uh, mode of capitalism that you are comparing now uh, with current forms of digital capitalism that are sort of similar, except uh, uh, concerning the role of the state, which is pretty much absent in current digital capitalism. It wasn't in mercantilism because it profited uh, from its businesses. Um, so what do you think? What would be the beginning of an end? I mean, is a historical comparison actually sensible even to start with? Or what could we learn, so to speak, uh, from that historical comparison? Well, n not to be misunderstood, I'm, of course, I am for the expansion of uh, workers' rights and so on. This is all very important. People should engage in that. And I also like to observe the outcome later on <laughs> as, a, as an academic. Um, but, I mean, thinking about it from a, yeah, well, is there something like an, well, there is something like an ontological aspect to political economy as well. And from that sort of perspective, you would, probably say that mercantilism ended by the introduction of productivity increases. Mm -hmm. Once it was possible, sort of, it, it overcame itself because the goal was to protect national economies, to build them up so they were not crushed by competition, so you had to control trade. And then you had this productivity explosion, which sort of made, for a certain amount of time, made trade, trade less important to say, economic growth and the political legitimacy that was connected to um, economic growth. Now, what would that mean for your question, right? If, if, you, if you frame it that way, um, it would mean that, we, that the best way out would be one where trade just isn't so important anymore, right? Um, for, for, the, for the reproduction um, of an economy, and that would probably an economy which grows a lot more than the ones um, we've lived in for the last, say, 30 years where we had secular stagnation mm -hmm. um, and so on. Um, now, I do not at all uh, believe in the 
in the huge productivity potential of the technologies we talk about when we talk about digitalization and so on. I just, I, well, I, I just don't see the data like uh, on, on, on that actually happening. So if that exit is blocked, I would argue we might want to look for another exit. And this other exit would not be, well, how could everybody participate in a better way in a system that is only ba that is basically aimed at rent seeking, right? Um, I mean, this is a question we can ask in the in the middle, sort of in a mid, uh, not like the the very long perspective. We we should probably rather ask um, if productivity increases were the basis for the industrial society, what would be the basis for a digital society that we want to live in, right? And then again. Um, I would, I'm, I'm a very empirical guy in a way, um, and uh, well, I, I say this often enough, but I have a son who is six years old, and before Corona, um, he loved to go to Fridays for Future, right? So there you have this whole idea of a different type of wealth, a different type of richness of society, um, which a lot of people can identify with. Why not use that instead of sort of trying to solve the situation through productivity or mercantilism? Is this what you mean uh, at the very end of your book, actually, when you talk of, now this is my translation, so forgive me, um, when you address the question of a society of digital rights, the central conflict, you write, of a future counter-movement would lie in the politicization of individual and collective freedom. Is that what you just refer to with Fridays for Future? As it is example? one way of spelling out what individual and collective freedom means. Yes, when my son goes to Fridays for Future and he feels like part of a movement, that's not individual freedom. Being able to go there might be individual freedom, but being there and sort of being fired up, that's collective freedom. And of course, I would argue that this is something that neoliberalism has targeted and tried to destroy, and this is something we should probably rediscover and or are already rediscovering, obviously. Thank you so much for your thoughts on digital capitalism. Philipp Staub, a round of applause for him <laughs> back home <laughs> and in here in the theater. Thank you, Hal. Tschüss, see you in, I think, the beginning, no, the end of May, right? What was that, Christian? In four weeks, four weeks from now, we're continuing this series, so have a good night. Tschüss. We're not shaking hands now, right?